Zeke? Thanks, Green. If the president believes that it's best for the country that he not be in the Oval Office for another four years, how can he assure the American people that he's up to be in the office for the next six months? Well, first I would say is that, um, and I've heard these suggestions out there, this is not an answer to, to you, this is an answer to the suggestions that I've had. I've, I've heard uh, about him resigning from office, we believe, and any suggestion of that note is ridiculous. It is not what we believe. The president, I just laid out what the president has been able to do in almost four years, and it's been successful. He's been able to do more, again, than any president has been able to do in two terms. He's been able to do that more in one term. And he wants to finish the job that he started and delivering more historic results for the American people. And look, he didn't step down from uh, from campaigning or from running because he didn't believe he can serve in a second term. That is not why. And what I would say, as I just finished my opening, I would say tune in. Tune in to what he has to say tonight, and he will lay that out for three, you all and the American people onto, as to why he made that decision. So you're saying he believes that he's capable of serving another four years, but he just doesn't believe that he can win another four years? I will let the president speak for himself. And so today, the president believes that he is capable, fully capable of serving in the office that he currently has now and for the next four and a half years if he, if, if if, he wanted to. If it, he wanted to absolutely. Do. And let me just quote from what he said on Sunday in his letter. He said, it is in the best interest of my party and the country for me to stand down and to focus solely on fulfilling my duties as president for the remainder of my term. And what the decision that he made on Sunday was about putting country first, was about his party, and was about the American people. Again, I would refer you to uh, what he's going to say tonight. He will lay that out, speak for himself, and you will hear directly from the American, for, from the president. The American people will insert you. Will as well. a different topic, uh, there's yeah, some, sure. uh, large protests uh, taking place in Washington. The White House is now ringed by anti-crime fencing. Uh, the Capitol, uh, there's some protests around the United States. Is the president monitoring these protests? Does he have a message to the people who are demonstrating right now? So it's basically what we have said for some time. We respect the right for all American to peacefully protest, peacefully protest. And obviously we will continue to strongly condemn any form of violence uh, as it relates certainly to protesting or destruction of property. We've been very, very clear, but Americans have the right to peacefully protest. Anything that is related to what's happening outside of this campus, uh, uh, the fencing, as you just mentioned to me, that's something for Secret Service to speak to directly. Is he watching protests? I mean, the president is, is uh, you know, he's always kept up to date on what's going on. Uh, I, you know, right now he's uh, certainly having meetings today with, uh, with his senior advisors and other senior staff. Uh, I can't speak if he's right now watching the protests. Uh, obviously, he's kept up to up, up to date into what's happening. Uh, but what I can say right now, we respect everyone's right to peacefully protest. We understand that this is a painful moment for many, many communities, but. Obviously, we're going to continue to condemn, strongly condemn any form of violence or any destruction of property. That is something we've been consistent on. Go ahead, Nancy. Thanks, Green. Uh, you read the president's statement where he said that it's in the country's best interest for him to step aside. Why is it in the country's best interest for him to step aside? Does it have to do with his health? or It does not have numbers? to do, there, they have nothing to do with his health. Again, the president's going to speak to this directly to the American people tonight in prime time. I know many of you all will be watching it. There are specials going on tonight. He will. I promise you, he will speak to this directly to all of you tonight. Uh, but in his letter, he talked about the country, he talked about the party, uh, he talked about the moment that we're in right now. Uh, it is not about his health. I can say no, that's not the reason, but hear, hear him out tonight. And the president denied for weeks, and you denied for yeah. weeks, that he was even thinking of stepping yeah. aside. What changed pr from all those days that he had that message yeah. to Sunday? So look. He's going to address this as well this evening, let him speak for himself. But here's what I will say. Um, and I think we gave a little bit of a TikTok to all of you. He met with a small group uh, of, um, of advisors on Saturday evening and, uh, and with his family and was thinking through how to move forward. Sunday afternoon, he made that decision. It was a, in a very short period of time, as you can imagine. And then at 1.45, he got on the phone with some of his assistants uh, to, uh, assistant to the president, uh, some advisors. He let them know. And then minutes later, a letter went out. So it was a, in a very short period of time 
that uh, the president was able to think about this and make a decision. But I would uh, say again, the president's going to address the American people. You will hear directly from him tonight. Yeah. Hey, can you talk a little more about how he's feeling after making such an extraordinary decision, like you said, making yeah. it quickly? Yeah. Did he feel bullied to leave the race? I'm going to let the president speak for himself. Uh, look, these are, n this, I mean, it's obviously is a historic moment, but a decision like this is very personal. It's not easy to make. Uh, and I think there are very rare, rare politicians who could look at the situation and make a decision, right? And I think it speaks to how honorable this president is, how selfless this president is, that he was able to make this decision and say, it is not about me, it is about the American people, it is about the country, and make, a, again, a personal difficult decision. And so I think that speaks for itself. I really do. I think that speaks for itself. And in the letter, as you all know, he said that he wanted to address the American people, was going to give remarks about his decision, and now we've come to that day where he's going to speak directly to the American people later tonight, and he's going to lay out what it is that he wants to say, what he, he believes the American people want to hear directly from him. Just switching gears a little bit to sure. um, uh, Netanyahu's remarks um, on Capitol Hill, we've heard Republicans um, voicing serious criticism against the Vice President for not being there, her team insisting that it was a scheduling conflict, but how do you respond to that? What does it say about her priorities, the administration's priorities, that she was not there? So let me just first say that the Vice President has has been unwavering uh, in her commitment to security of Israel. Uh, as you know, she's been a partner with this President for the past four years, not just dom domestic issues, but obviously also foreign policy issues. She's going to meet with the Prime Minister, uh, uh, Bibi Netanyahu, uh, when he's here. And so, again, has been a critical partner in ensuring that Israel can uh, defend itself and uh, to secure hostage deal, as you know, the president, we've been talking about that for some time, making sure that we have this hostage deal. She's been a, a partner in that. Uh, and that's what I can certainly uh, say, uh, you know, that she continues to be supportive uh, to Israel, making sure that uh, Israel's security is, is ironclad, as we have been, as the partner, as uh, the president has been, uh, and she's going to meet with the prime minister. Given the historic nature of Kamala Harris being the top of the ticket, um, is does the president have any regrets about the way that he handed this enormous responsibility off in such a you know unusual, shortened kind of truncated fashion, not having her have a normal ascendancy to that top position? Oh, I mean, the president has no regrets. Has no regrets. Let's not forget the vice president obviously has been vice president for more than four years. I do not see anyone who is uh, more qualified uh, to step in in this moment, right? She was a senator. She was an attorney general. Uh, she's been a partner to this president, a critical partner, as I've said. I've listed out what we've been able to accomplish in the last three and a half, almost four years, an unprecedented record. She was a partner in that to the president. Uh, and so, Look, this is, again, a decision that this president made, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, he is uh, proud to have made that decision. I know so. Uh, you saw it in, uh, in, in what he has been able to say since Sunday. Uh, he's going to be on camera later today, obviously, to address uh, the American people from the Oval Office because of this moment and how big this moment is. He wants to do that. He wants to make sure that Americans hear directly from him again after putting out about the letter on Sunday. And if you could distill just into a few kind of bite-sized pieces, what specific policies, <clears throat> actions, does the president want to get done in these last few months? So he certainly wants to build on what we've been able to do. You heard me say this has been a, certainly what he's been able to accomplish in the four, four, four years in this first term uh, is more than we have seen in presidents who have done eight, uh, many presidents who have done eight. And he is going to be known as a consequential president of his time. And so 
He's going to continue to build on those successes. Uh, I mean, let's not forget, if it wasn't for the American uh, Rescue Plan, we wouldn't be able to get out of the pandemic. We wouldn't be able to open up schools. We wouldn't be able uh, to open up uh, business. Businesses wouldn't be able to open up again. There's an Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which was also an incredibly important piece of legislation. If you think about climate change and dealing with that, if you think about um, um, if you think about being able to be, beat Big Pharma, uh, you think about the infrastructure legislation, which was done in a bipartisan way. This president was able to get that done. Chips and Science Act, again, a bipartisan way. This president was able to reach across the aisle and get that done. Uh, you think about NATO making that stronger and bigger. I mean, there are many ways. I'm just naming a few things that the president's been able to do. Look. They, both of them, the president and vice president, are proud to have delivered these res historic results. And we're going to continue to figure out ways on how to build on, on this progress. So that's going to be his focus. We will have a lot more to share. I'm not going to call out, name out policies at this time. Uh, but you certainly will hear uh, from this president. He's going to run through the finish line. No concerns about being a lame duck. We don't see ourselves as a lame duck president at all. At all, in a, in this in this period of time, uh, this is a president that has been incredibly successful, and he's going to do everything that he can to continue to fight for the American people. I would say, stay tuned, watch. Thank you, Kareem. Um, I have two questions: one on the vice president, and then one on the president's decision. Uh, first. It's clear that President Biden and Vice President Harris have met regularly, including their standing lunches from the outset of the administration. But I'm, I'm wondering now, since he made his decision, if there are any plans to increase the cadence of those interactions or if he plans to include her in more of his policy making processes, how will that relationship and that involvement change? So what I can say is the president and the vice president speak regularly. They see each other regularly. You name some ways of how they've been able to do that, to stay in touch and uh, see each other in person. Uh, the, the president is committed to being president and leading this country forward. Uh, in the way that he believes that Americans want to see this country moving forward. And the vice president's going to be continue to be a critical partner. Nothing's going to change in that. Um, but uh, they're going to continue to engage, interact, uh, and have important conversations as it relates to policies and moving forward. That's not going to stop. Uh, and uh, and I just, I'll leave it there. And on the timing of his decision, it's now been widely reported that when Senator Chuck Schumer went to visit with the president, in Rehoboth um, a week ago Saturday that President Biden said, I need another week. What did he need another week for? Um, so here, I'll say this. They had a very good conversation, uh, the President and, and Senator Schumer. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not going to go into their private conversation. I'm not going to go into particulars, uh, but it was a good conversation. You said it was a very short time frame in which the president was uh, to, in making was that decision, right? When he started thinking decision. about it and making that decision, he st it started Saturday evening and on Sunday afternoon, he made his decision. But it sounds like he was presented with data a week. Prior. I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to get into specifics. It started Saturday evening. The next afternoon, which was Sunday afternoon, he made that decision. A small group of advisors, including uh, family, was with him on Sunday, on Saturday night, and then Sunday afternoon he made the decision. That's that's how it it happened. That's how it it he he came to um, to announcing it. And on the messaging to us to the press corps, it's been nine days since there's been a briefing. The president obviously published his letter officially yeah. on Sunday, withdrawing from the race. Why? go on television to make your first comments about that decision yeah. rather than make No, make I appreciate that. We've always had a protocol here. When the president's not here, we don't do a briefing. That's just a, the way that we've always, hap it's always happened. The interview that I did yesterday was on the books for about two, three weeks. It was way before, way before the president made his decision. That's it. Okay. Did the president uh, exit the race because he didn't think he could defeat Donald Trump in November? I'm not going to get into into specific details of his thoughts. I would say tune in to tonight when he speaks directly to the American people. You'll hear what he thought thinks about this, his decision. He said in his letter that he would he wanted to address the American people about this decision that he made on Sunday. I would tune in to that, and you'll hear directly from him. And also similar to some of the questions my colleagues have asked for weeks, uh, people from this podium yeah. and other top spokespeople for the president were adamant that there was no way he was dropping out. Yeah. Um, 
just in terms of credibility moving forward, I'm curious if you guys could just address um, that. I mean, I kind of addressed it a couple times of the president's decision making. When we all, t when when folks from my team, from folks from uh, this White House, said that he wasn't going to drop out or he was not planning to drop out, that's where we were. That's where we were in that time. That's that is the guidance that we had. So I mean, it's not about you guys not receiving the proper guidance. I, I, Tyler, on sa on Saturday night, he met with a small group of advisors and his family and that's when the decision started Sunday he made the final Sunday afternoon he made the final decision that's where we were uh, and we've talked about this this was a dynamic situation it was this is a historic moment you have to that that is true uh, and it was for this the president to come to that decision to come to that decision when we told you all that the president you heard from the president, he's not going to drop out. And he actually addressed it himself, not just us. There were multiple events, multiple opportunities where the president said he's in it. So you heard directly from him multiple times after the debate. You know, the president, again, met with his a small group of advisors on Saturday. Sunday, he made his final decision. That's how it worked. And That's how it happened. I get a better sense from him about what went into I, the I, he I would tune in tonight. I would let the president speak for himself in this moment. Um, given the uh, level of support the Vice President has received from lawmakers, other Democrats, donors, um, the party in general, has the President expressed any sentiment that maybe he should have made his decision sooner and, and given her a longer timeline? What I will say is this was a difficult decision to make, a personal decision to make, and the, personal, the President made it. And I will leave it as that. Has he given any um, advice at this point uh, to the vice president in her process of picking a running mate? They speak regularly. They speak often. Obviously, they've spoken a couple of times. Uh, and I'm not going to get into their private discussions. Okay. Is the vice president or her staff going to be more closely involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the administration, given that she's now the I, I kind of got this question moments ago. Um, nothing more to add where... The vice president's been a critical partner. She's been uh, important, played an important role to a lot of decisions that have been made uh, in the past three and a half years. That's not going to change. Uh, and the president has always obviously appreciated her uh, her policy savvy, her uh, her ideas, her thoughts, and that's going to continue. And say now, look, the president is still president. You know, he's still very much commander-in-chief. He's still very much the president of the United States. And he's still very much going to lead this country in the way, in the direction that he believes uh, is right, is the right way to do it. Uh, so that doesn't change. That's not going to change. And just make sure I understood your answer earlier. Yeah. They have spoken about the VP selection specifically? or the Oh, the VP selection. selection, that is something, obviously, I can't speak to. The campaigns, the campaign side could speak to. What I can say is, uh, I, I heard the question as giving advice to the vice president uh, in, in in any way, right? Uh, they've spoken many times. I'm just not going to get into private conversation. The VP pick specifically, anything related to that, obviously the campaign can speak to that more. If you want more details, but, but Vice President Harris won't have extra staff in meetings that wouldn't normally be there for some sort of overlap. I would say that campaign. nothing nothing is going to change. The president is the president of the United States. He's going to continue to lead, uh, you know, lead this administration the way that he sees fit. They are partners. They are partners. Uh, they have been. She's been, again, a critical partner in some of the big piece items that we've been able to get done on behalf of, of this country. Obviously, she's, all, she's going to play a role as she has done in the past. Prime Minister's speech. Uh, I that just ended not too too uh, too long after I came out here. I have not talked to the president about this. If he was able to catch uh, some of the prime minister's speech, yeah. obviously they're going to, as you know, they're going to be meeting here at the White House. Prime Minister uh, Bibi Netanyahu and the president is going to be meeting here tomorrow. Okay. Thanks, Green. Uh, this was a White House that was operating obviously with an eye towards the next six months, but also thinking it might have four more years to serve as well. Can, I know it's early, but can you talk through whether there's been any sort of new direction about how this White House will operate, given that you, you only have this short amount of time left? And obviously, the president was also balancing a re-election campaign at the same time. Does this free him up? Uh, are there considerations being given to what else he might be able to do that he might not have? So 
don't have any policy announcements to make at this time. The president is going to continue to do what he has set out to do for the you know, next several months, uh, even while he was indeed running uh, for re-election, which is pretty consistent, building on the accomplishment that he's been able to get done. That's going to be really important. He's going to look at this remainder, remainder, uh, uh, remainder of his term, and there's going to be important issues that he wants to get done. Don't have anything right now to, to lay out, uh, but we want to continue to build on those accomplishments. We've gotten a lot of things done, whether it's health care, whether it's the economy, whether it's manufacturing, right? We want to continue to build on that. And so the president is determined. He is determined to get that done. One of the first uh, major initiatives that the president asked the vice president to lead was to oversee the diplomatic work uh, with Central American countries as it relates to flows of migration. Uh, the House Rules Committee yesterday approved a resolution that will go to a vote of the full House strongly condemning the Biden administration and its borders are the vice president for failure to secure the border. Do you have a response to that? And how, how would the president characterize what he views as um, the vice president's accomplishments in terms of overseeing that portfolio? I mean, look, as we speak, uh, you have congressional Republicans, they continue doing their, continue with their month long blockade of critical resources that we need for the border. Uh, whether it's ICE, uh, Border Patrol, uh, and uh, this is what they've been doing. This is what they've been doing. Let's not forget the bipartisan, a really tough, important bipartisan piece of legislation uh, or a deal that came out of the Senate uh, that we were able to get done, and they got in their own way. They got in their own way because they listened to the former president, because they thought it would help Joe Biden. So they continue to block critical resources. That's what they have done for the past three and a half years. The president is looking for ways to fund to fund uh, security funding to, to get to the border, right? And he's done that in a record way. Uh, and so we're gonna continue to fight to make sure that the Border Patrol agents get what they need uh, and get more personnel, thousands of new personnel at the border. That's what we're gonna do. The president announced new decisive executive orders to secure the border on lawful crossings have dropped by more than 50%. And that's the president acting without Congress by 50%. They are now lowered at this point than they were in 2019 and lower than when the former president left office. And the president's doing that on his own, on his own. They get in the way, he finds other ways to, to uh, make things happen. That's been the story of this administration. One more question. Obviously, uh, the Secret Service director uh, resigned yesterday. I'm also curious if there is any consideration to increasing the security around the vice president now. Uh, and whether the resources of the Secret Service are affected by that um, in that decision. As yeah, well. that's something for the Secret Service uh, to speak to. That's something for the Vice President's campaign to speak to. Uh, I, I don't have anything to add uh, on that as, as it relates to uh, protection. How are you doing with all of this, Corinne? <laughs> you care about how I feel? Are you going to stick around for a potential President Harris. Oh my goodness. Let me just get through the day. Can I just get through today? Uh, I do have Every some other day. questions. <laughs> no, I think it's good. I think we're good. I think we're good. Great. How are you doing? Are you I'm good? doing okay. Thank yeah. you. I haven't seen you in a while. Well, uh, you guys haven't had a press briefing since <laughs> President Biden dropped out of the race. So. The president hasn't been here. He just got here yesterday. And now I'm here taking your questions. Thank you. I, yeah, I, and I've taken about three or four at this point from you. Alone. Well, <laughs> it, it would seem that people in this White House knew that President Biden was slipping. And it was hidden from the American people. So who ordered White House officials to cover up a declining president? I know that the, that is a narrative that you love. And, uh, well, wait, to, no, 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 wait, hold days, on. He did a press conference hold at NATO. On. I'm in it. There's all these things hold that I need on. to finish. And then 10 days later, I'm dropping out. Okay, wait, okay, you're asking me like two multiple questions here. Let me, wait, wait. First of all, there's been no cover up. I want to be very clear about that. I know that's the narrative that you all want. Wait, no, 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 you can't even. Well, <laughs> okay. I've been, with, I've been with President Biden for. Five Are years. you going to let me answer the question? Would you at least admit that the debate I, was not just I, a I, Wait, can, can I answer the question? Yes. All right. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. To your first question, it is not a cover-up. I know that is the narrative that you all want. It is not. <clears throat> I'm going to say this again. 
and you're you're gonna hear directly from the press. I hope you listen tonight. I think it's gonna be incredibly powerful and important. The Oval Office presidents, as you know, when they make speeches from the Oval Office, it's because there are important moments that they want to directly uh, make sure that the American people hear from them, and it's obviously gonna be done in prime time. I would listen to the president. And then what I will say is that it is not easy making a decision that the president made on Sunday. It is just not. It is not. And as all you have you all reported, it is historic. It is unusual. This is not the norm. And making a decision like that for someone who has been in public service for 54 years, U.S. Senator for 36, President to uh, Vice President to President Obama for eight, and now a first term as president himself. These are not easy decisions to make. They're just not. And so the fact that he was able to make that decision in a selfless way, that's admirable. One of the decisions he made, President Biden wants Vice President Harris to be the standard bearer of the party now. Does she still want to get rid of ICE? You have seen what this administration has been able to do in the past three and a half years, and they did that with uh, the vice president as a partner in that. And Republicans got in the way, the president went around Republicans and was able to get thousands of personnel at the border, and now we are seeing a 50% drop at the border. And that's because of what this president has done. As a partner though, she's been in charge of root causes of migration for years. She has never spoken to the Border Patrol Chief Jason Owens or the Border Pat Patrol Chief before him, Raul Ortiz. What should that tell us about her leadership style? She was supposed to be doing root causes dealing with diplomacy. And diplomacy. Wait, diplomacy. That's what her job was supposed to be. Dipl diplomatic. That's the job. And it, I, I understand that you're asking these questions, but we should also look at congressional Republicans who got in the way, literally got in the way of everything that this president was trying to do to deal with the border. They got in the way. They would say one thing and then they would change their mind. They would say, we want border patrol, we want, uh, uh, you know, we want a deal on, on what's happening at the border, and then they would walk away from it. And they did it because of what the former president said. You guys reported that. I didn't, that's not coming from me. Some of your colleagues reported that the former president said, let's not move forward with this proposal because it's going to help Joe Biden. I mean, that's also the reality. You got to talk about both sides here. Good. I, I, Great. This is, yeah, I, 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 get, I, get, I get I get that you're not going to give us, gotta, I, I get that you, you might have to. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, go ahead, Fine. Peter. One more. Unbelievable. I get that you don't probably want to give to see you too, James. a specific yeah. name, but were there any names that came <laughs> forward that surprised you of Democratic officials? in the last week who stabbed President Biden in the back. I don't have anything else to say. Go ahead, April. I'll come in really fast, two questions. Yep. Uh, one on uh, Sonia Massey. Um, yeah. This is something that's continued to happen. The president, before he even became president, was really pushing after the George Floyd uh, death, police-involved death. Yeah. What is the lesson learned, I guess, if you will? He couldn't get it through Congress, but he did come up with federal executive orders and efforts. But what is the lesson learned from this moment that continues to happen that I guess Kamala Harris might have to start dealing with as well if she becomes president? I mean, when you say lesson learned, meaning? How could you have done something differently or what could you have done to maybe change the dynamic? So, I think, got to step back a couple, for a second here. The president has been able to reach across the aisle and get a lot of things done. He has. Gun, gun legislation, the first bipartisan gun legislation that we saw in decades, that was important. Uh, and there's issues that, um, you know, infrastructure legislation was able to get that done. He reached over uh, across the line and got uh, bipartisan support. So we have seen this president and this vice president be very successful in doing that. Uh, there have some, been some issues that have been a little harder to your point, police reform. And what the president did was, was when that wasn't able to get done in a bipartisan way in Congress, he took an executive order to deal with it on the federal, federal law enforcement level. And that was a step that he was able to take. 
and he's going to continue. It doesn't stop. You heard me mention the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act probably twice or three times at the top because it's important to, to, use, uh, to use our platform, to use this podium, to continue to call for what we believe is right. Uh, there's always going to be lessons in how people govern and decisions that we made here, uh, but there's also been a lot of success. And when action wasn't happening in Congress, the president took action. The president took action. So as you said, you mentioned this at the top, yeah. emphasizing this heinous death and yeah. how it happened. But is this something that the president hopes, I mean, it was one of his passion projects. Yeah. In 2020, for sure. Yes. Absolutely. Do you, does the president hope that if Kamala Harris becomes president of the United States, that she could champion this and that she could get what he Absolutely. could get done? Absolutely. Absolutely. For sure. Absolutely. This is an important issue for this president. He's going to do everything that he can, you know, with the end, with the rest of his term to get this done. He's still going to work on this. It doesn't stop. Get Michael. That's great. Um, a few days before the president uh, announced his withdrawal from the race, he uh, said that he was going to be rolling out proposals for Supreme Court reform. Uh, is he still committed to that? Uh, Look, the president believes that um, yeah. if, when you hold a high office, you should be held by a certain ethics and transparency. That's something that the president believes. And so he certainly will uh, uh, continue to do everything that he can. I don't have any policy announcements to make at this moment today in front of you. Uh, but uh, once we will, we certainly will share that. And just secondly, uh, has the president spoken with uh, former President Obama since making the decision? No calls to read out. Okay. Thank you. I have a foreign policy related sure. question. President Biden will be one of the few sitting presidents since the establishment of U.S. China relations now to visit China during his tenure. Could you please explain the reasoning behind this decision? Isn't this a missed opportunity? So, you heard from the National Security Advisor himself many times when we've talked about our relationship uh, with China. It's been very deliberate uh, uh, in, its, in our strategy and our approach uh, to our relationship with China, very deliberate. Uh, and as you've heard us say many, many times, again, I mentioned the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, we are pursuing competition without conflict. That has been our goal from day one of this administration. Uh, you know, the, met, the president, as you know, met in a bilateral fashion with uh, President Xi uh, just last November, as you know, in California, uh, with that goal in mind. Again, we want competition without conflict. Uh, so we have also had a number of cabinet secretaries. We've, we've, we've spoken to that. Uh, whether it is uh, Secretary, um, uh, is it Secretary Blinken or uh, the Treasury Secretary? They've had travels uh, to China over the past uh, several years and, and many more. And so, we'll, we're going to continue to have these high-level uh, um, officials travel uh, there to China to continue to have those conversations. But we have been incredibly deliberate with our strategy. Uh, again, competition without conflict. That's how we're moving forward. There are still a few months left. Yeah. Will there still be opportunity? Say that last part. Would there still be a chance he may go abroad? I don't. I don't have anything to share <laughs> about uh, foreign travel. Uh, but we have been very deliberate with our strategy. We believe it's worked, and we're going to continue to move forward in that fashion. Go ahead, Danny. Thanks, Green. Um, the president said that he wants to push for a Gaza ceasefire in his last six months in office, but. Um, Prime Minister Netanyahu just gave a pretty really uncompromising speech to Congress uh, and that's just a day before he comes here to the White House. Does the President really believe that Netanyahu sounds like a man who's likely to go for a peace deal? So let me just say a couple of things. I do want to uh, give our reaction to, um, uh, to the Prime Minister's speech. So we appreciate Prime Minister Netanyahu for thanking uh, President Biden for his unwavering support for Israel and his efforts to secure the release of the hostages. Uh, President Biden looks forward to meeting uh, the Prime Minister here tomorrow uh, to discuss developments in Gaza, including negotiations on a ceasefire deal and the humanitarian situation on the ground. And my colleagues in, in the four o'clock hour is going to, uh, at NSC is going to hold a, a press call where they're going to address additional questions regarding the Prime Minister's address and also his visit. So I would certainly tune in. Uh, you'll hear more from, from them directly. Look, they're going to meet tomorrow. 
Uh, the president has always been clear on how uh, and how uh, he sees uh, the future, a two-state solution. He's always supported that. That's something that he's going to continue uh, to speak to. They're going to have a conversation tomorrow. The president looks forward to that. The vice president is also going to have uh, a meeting uh, with the prime minister tomorrow. And so I'll leave it there. But the, uh, my, the National Security Council is going to be doing a, a press call, so I would certainly refer you to any, any further questions that you may have on the visit. I've got no sense of whether he does have uh, any confidence that this is, this is really an achievable goal in his last six months? I believe that the president is optimistic. This is a president that believes that anything could happen uh, if you stay focused, if you work hard towards it. So uh, he's going to be optimistic. Uh, the work continues. And uh, that's not going to stop him for sure. Yeah, Jerry. Uh, given that, that you've had a lot of questions about the president's agenda here over the next six months, I'm curious, does the president believe that some of what he'd like to get through Congress between now and the end of the year is made easier if he's not a candidate? I, I don't quite understand the question because he's not on the, on the. Does he think that, that it'll be easier, harder, the same to, to kind of get some of these things I mean, that he's been I, struggling to get through would, Congress through now? I, well, first of all, this has been the fact that the president has gotten this much done, right? The, the historic pieces of legislation. Well, we wait, hold on. Let me. <laughs> you guys got to give me a second to answer <laughs> to at My least to, to actually warm up into the into the answer. Um, so look, the president has gotten a lot done. Historic amount of legislation passed. Historic pieces of legislation passed, and that's and that's that wasn't done with an easy political climate. Right. It's not. I mean, I think you could agree with me there. Uh, and so, look, we're going to have more to share on what the next several months, the final several months of his term is going to look like. We will share that. Uh, the president wants to build, continue to build on those historic initiatives uh, that he was able to get done. This has not been an easy political climate. And some of that work, he was did it in a bipartisan way. And when he wasn't able to get it done in a bipartisan way, he found policy, uh, ways to do that with an executive action, and we've been able to be successful, whether it's the border, right, whether it's trying to get things done on student on the student loan side. There's been ways that the president has been very still very, very focused on making sure we're delivering on the initiatives, on the goals that we set out to do in the beginning of this administration. That doesn't stop. That doesn't stop. Okay. Thank you. I have two questions, domestic and foreign policy on domestic. Was there any reason why the president did not endorse the vice president in the first week? It took like a while, maybe 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, I mean, look, the first meeting. When he, the first week was he was drawn from the race, but he did not say clearly that he is endorsing her. From the letter to the, the letter that he sent. To the tweet. Yeah. Uh, there was a half hour. It was, it was, it was because it was a 30 minutes. Yes. You're questioning a 30 minute window? <laughs> because he's, no, I'm not questioning. I'm just asking if there was a reason. I, I mean, that. Uh, Look, he put out a letter to the American people about a decision that he had made. That deserved a standalone letter, I believe, right? A decision, an important historic decision. He wanted to do that and speak directly to the American people. That's why he did the letter. And then, obviously, 30 minutes later, uh, you, you got the endorsement. That's not a that's not a significant amount, but it's not a significant amount of time. I think if you look at the letter, you see that he was truly trying to lay down the decision, a very weighty decision, and he wanted to say that directly to the American people. Fair enough. Thank you for approving that answer. <laughs> <laughs> my second question on foreign policy, just to follow up on sure. your previous question. Um, what message does the administration send to the world when we see the White House is barricaded? Uh, but in, in, in the anticipation of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's visit here? that ISIS found a reasonable ground to indict him as a war criminal, and 70 percent of Israelis want him to step down. So look, I can't speak to uh, Israelis. That's, that's, you know, I'm not going to speak to domestic politics. I think we've been very clear on our feelings about ICC and their recommendation, something that we do not agree on. We've been very clear about that. Look, when it comes to what we're seeing outside, um, as you said, uh, the, the barricades and such, that's something for Secret Service to speak to. They can speak to why they feel that it's needed. Uh, that is not for me to speak to. But it doesn't change the fact that we believe in uh, the right for all Americans to peacefully protest. That is something that we've always been very clear about. It is 
the right of all Americans to peacefully protest. And we understand that this is an incredibly painful moment for many communities. And we respect that. And also, in that same vein, we're going to strongly condemn any type of violence uh, or uh, destruction of property. That is something that we've been very clear about as well. Uh, but peacefully protest, that's something that we support. I can't speak to, there's reasons why the Secret Service uh, is deciding to do that. That is for them, for them to speak to directly. Okay. Okay. Hi, thank you, Karine, very much. Um, Karine, uh, you were saying how difficult was this decision for President uh, Biden. Uh, what is his mood since he took this decision? And what will be the tone of the uh, address tonight? Also, uh, what did he uh, decide to do from the Oval Office? I wonder if he's going to do yes. any campaigning from... So, a couple, a couple of things. Look, I, I saw the President not too long ago, a couple hours ago. He's determined. Uh, he's in good spirits. Uh, he wants to speak directly to the American people tonight. That is his focus. He is doing it from the Oval Office because as many of you all reported, and we agree with all of you, this is an important moment. This is a historic moment. And uh, this decision <coughs> was a big decision, was an important decision. And Oval Offices are used for moments uh, that, I would say moments like these that are historic. So he wants to do it from the Oval. He's going to do it in prime time. He's going to speak directly to the American people. I would say, again, tune in. You'll hear from what he has to say. And I think, um, I think it's going to be important. I think it's going to be important. Do you expect that he's going to ask people to vote for Harris from the <laughs> Oval or doing a campaign? It's going to be a speech, uh, I believe, we believe, that is uh, going to be important for the American people to hear directly from this president in this moment, in this historic moment, uh, and I'm not going to get into details, get into specifics. I've said this many times from here, not going to get ahead of the president. This is an opp his opportunity, his opportunity uh, for, uh, to explain that decision and for the American people to, to listen in. So I know I got to go. Go ahead. Thanks so much, Queen. Can you give us any more color about the preparation for the speech? Who's been helping um, the president write it? If he's been sounding, you know, using anybody as a sounding board? Um, I, I, I'm not going to go into details. Uh, obviously, this is the president. Is a speech that the president's very deeply involved in. Uh, you don't uh, use the Oval Office um, often. You you use it for incredibly important m t moments. Um, and that's what you're going to hear tonight. I'm just not going to get into specifics as to how the president is preparing. Um, I will say this, obviously his senior advisors are <coughs> always heavily involved. Uh, and this is a president that's taking this uh, very seriously, very focused, like he does with any other speech. Uh, and so tune in, tune in. And can you say whether or not you'd be um, willing to have the president's doctor come to the podium, particularly given that he is the president, does intend to serve out his term, and there have been a number of questions about, you know, his fitness for office. Is, I mean, some of those questions could be settled if perhaps there's a, you know, the doctor, if his doctor would come to the podium, or if more medical records could be released. You've heard from the, the president's doctor, I believe, every day that he had COVID. He gave... Uh, his assessment of what was what was going on, what was happening. Uh, there was a memo that was sent out to all of to all of you. Obviously, the memo was given to me, and we shared it publicly. I don't have anything else. We, and you've heard me say this many times. There was uh, an extensive medical ev evaluation that was done, uh, physical that was done in February. You all have that. Uh, I just don't have anything else to share from here. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'll be back tomorrow.